All right, so let me give you a little background. Mark 13, Jesus has just finished a bunch of discourses with a lot of the religious leaders in the temple precincts and in the courts and the court of women, so on and so forth. Remember, they had tried to stump him. They had tried to trip him up in the midst of all the people about, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Or, you know, you know there's going to be this resurrection one day, Jesus, and they give him this example about, well, what if a woman's married to, and, and her husband dies seven times? Who's she going to be married to? How's that going to work in, in your so-called afterlife in heaven? And Jesus has to correct their thought process on that. He goes, we're going to be like the angels of God in heaven. I can't rehash the whole message. I'm just bringing you up to speed. So all these different groups of religious leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, are trying to trip Jesus up, all right? And they can't do it. And then after they try to trip him up, he gives an invitation to the people. Before he gives the invitation to the people, he says, beware of people who just love the power in, in ministry, who love their position. He said, watch out for those people. And he goes, stay away from them. And, and, and then he goes on and he takes his disciples aside with, from, from the, the midst of the people and he kind of camps out outside the court of women where the offering boxes were left, 13 offering boxes. And he's just standing there a little bit away and he tells his disciples, he says, guys, look, do you see this widow? He, she, he goes, she's given into the treasury, into the temple treasury, more than everybody you've seen today because she gave out of her necessity. She gave all she had. And he does this to teach them to contrast. See, the religious leaders were all about the higher-ups, the people who gave a lot of money. They butted them up and tried to get alongside with them and, you know, politic and, and all this stuff to get their, their place. And, but Jesus takes, the, takes his disciples aside and he goes, I want you to see something what giving's all about. He goes, you see this woman? A lot of people were given out of their abundance. And he said, that's fine. That's good. And so they should. He goes, but you, he goes, you know what real giving to God is? He goes, it's sacrificing. It should cost you something. It should hurt. Now, that was last week's message. I'm not going to teach you on giving again. Pastor Matt, you said you never teach on giving. You did last week. Well, only when we go through. But I'm just telling you to bring you up to speed where we are. So, now his disciples, they move away from this discourse about the woman, the widow who gave all she had, right? And as they're walking away from the Temple Mount, they turn back and they look at this awesome structure. It was a beautiful structure, one of the wonders of the world at that time. And then Jesus is going to stop them and he's going to explain to them about the temple, what's going to happen to the temple, and he's going to take what he's telling them from that time all the way to the end of time. Because they're concerned about the future. What's going to happen to Israel? What's going to happen to your people? What's going to happen to us? When are you coming, in, coming again? We thought that you, you know, you, you're going to set up your kingdom. And remember, Jesus is just a couple days here from the cross. So they still have in their mind that eventually he's coming in judgment and he's coming in power and he's setting up a kingdom. They still have that thought process. And Jesus has given them hints and clues all the way through his ministry that, hey, you know something? It's not going to be the way you think. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be turned on. And I'm going to be crucified. But I'm going to rise again. And th th they're not hearing it. One time Peter hears it and he goes, what? This isn't going to happen to you. Absolutely not, Lord. And Jesus has to rebuke him for that. So that's the context of where we are. They, they leave this discourse about Jesus teaching them about the widow and her sacrificial giving. And it says, and as they went out, as he went out, chapter 13 of Mark's gospel, verse 1. As he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. He goes, Master, do you see this temple? Do you see these buildings? We thought that you were going to eventually come in and, and rule and reign over this temple. No more Herod. No more Romans. What about the temple? 
What about the center of Jewish life and sacrifice and all that? We, we, y'all, if y'all the Messiah, do you see these buildings? I mean, what's going on? Now we're going back out. We're walking away from the temple. And he turns back and he says, listen. And Jesus answers and says unto them, said unto him, one of the disciples, you've got to cross-reference Matthew 24 to fill in the blanks, by the way. It's same discourse. And Jesus answering said unto him, seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, so they could see the temple, he's sitting on the side of the Mount of Olives, which is really just like a big, big hill, all right? He sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately another question. So get the context of what's going on. Jesus, do you see these buildings? Do you see these temples? Do you see the temple? Do you see these buildings? Well, they're thinking, when are you going to rule from here? When are you going to reign from here? And he totally flips it on them. He goes, let me tell you what's going to happen. He goes, you see this building? He goes, there's not going to be one stone left upon another. Now, to them, that is shocking. The, The stones of the temple were massive, huge, Okay, gigantic. It took years and years and years to put the temple, reconstruct it, get it back together in in, in Herod's time. And it was Herod the Great who kind of oversaw that building process. That, That took 40 years in itself just to reconstruct the temple in his day. And then Jesus tells them, do you see these stones? Not one's gonna be left on another. Massive stones, massive buildings. So literally, this prophecy was literally fulfilled, okay? In 70 AD, in the destruction of the temple, what happened was the Romans surrounded the city, started to starve out the city, and their general at at the time, Titus, says, don't touch the temple, leave the temple. Well, some Roman soldiers get a little overzealous, and this is what happens. They start to fire arrows into the temple, fiery arrows, Some of the tapestries, the wool woven things inside the temple catch fire, okay? Literally, the temple starts to go up because you have all these stones on the outside. You have gold and artifacts lining the inside. It's like a wood-burning stove. So the tapestries start to go up. It gets so hot, the gold starts to melt. This literally happened in AD 70. Jesus is telling them exactly what's going to happen in the near future. The gold starts to melt down in between the stones, these massive stones so the temple's now destroyed and to get the gold out the roman soldiers say hey they literally pry one stone off another and they start to pick the gold out exactly what jesus said not one stone will be left on another now listen this is the difficulty in interpreting in mark 13 and matthew 24 stay with me now if anybody likes to study end times things and what's going to happen in the last days you have to understand Mark 13 and Matthew 24, okay? There are some interpreters out there that will tell you all of Mark 13 and Matthew 24 was fulfilled in the first century. They'll say everything already happened in the destruction of the temple. I don't believe that. I believe what happened in the destruction of the temple is a foreshadow, a type or a picture of what's going to happen in the last days. Now stay with me. And that's why as Jesus goes through this in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, he gives it to you both ways. He almost repeats himself as to what's going to happen. So this is what I believe. This is what I teach. And I, you know, I love my brothers who believe different things. I'm cool with them. I'll debate with them. We'll go back and forth. But this is what I believe. I believe The destruction of the temple that Jesus is prophesying about here in the first century is a type or a foreshadow of something greater that's going to happen in the last days. Has to be. Has to be. Because everything in Mark 13 and in Matthew 24 could not have been fulfilled in the first century. We'll read through it. Stars didn't fall from the sky. The sun didn't go out. The moon wasn't darkened. All those things did not happen yet. There was no abomination of desolation set up. People saying, well, what, what, what's that? What's an abomination of desolation? What are you talking about, Pastor Matt? Just give me some time, I'll get there. And I'll figure out a way to tie this into communion. So stay with me. 
All right? All right. So ready? I, I, I tie, this is how I'll tie it in. Jesus says we do this in memory of him until he comes. So when he comes, right? When he comes, when we, when we take communion, we should be thinking about, you know what? We're going to do this with him finally when he comes. When he comes. So there we go. Tied it together for you. All right. So now listen. The disciples come, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, and they say, Jesus, well, when's this going to happen with the temple? But they ask him a little bit more too. Verse 4, Mark 13. Tell us, when shall these things be? What? When's this temple going to get destroyed? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Matthew 24 fills us in a little bit more detail. Matthew 24, they say, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Interesting. So Jesus is going to tell them when those things are going to happen. He's going to answer their questions exactly. When are those things going to happen about the destruction of the temple that did happen in AD 70? And what's going to happen right before the end of the world and his coming? Watch what he says. Verse 5. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled. For such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. Listen to what he says. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. And there shall be famines, troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. So what is Jesus outlining for us here? Famines, earthquakes, wars. He says, these things will happen. When did the beginning of sorrow start? Right in the first century. We've been in the beginnings of sorrows for a long time. Listen, I watch these modern day prophets. They go, oh, this earthquake happened over there. And the coronavirus did. This is the beginning of sorrows. I said, it's been pretty sorrowful for a long time. Okay. Sorrows have been going on for a long time. What Jesus is telling them there is what? He doesn't want his people, every time there's a worldwide event, every time there's an earthquake, every time there's a tidal wave, every time something bad happens, every time there's a war, it's the end. It's the end. And what does the church do from the first century until now? Everything that happens, it's the end. It's the end. Let's go sit on a mountain and pray. Sell everything. That's, listen, that's what the Thessalonian church was doing. And I'll probably refer to, their, to that as we go through this. That's exactly what they did. They're like, wait a minute, the persecution so much, this has got to be the end. Let's sell everything, let's not work, and just sit around and wait for Jesus to come get us. And Paul writes to them and he says, don't do that, go back to work. Because if you can't feed your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. That's what he tells them. All right? So men... Adam's curse is you need to keep working to the day you die. You never get to retire. All right? All right. All right. So, Jesus tells them, don't let anybody deceive you. The beginning of sorrows is going to start. It's going to happen for a long time. When a woman gives birth to a child, he likens these things as you read through this in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. He likens it or he gives the example of a, a woman in labor, labor pains. I don't know about you ladies. Now, my, my wife you know, was in labor, 120 hours, 118 hours. This lady sitting there like, that's nothing. I was two days in labor. Two days. All right? Two days, oh my goodness. And I wanted no part of it, all right? I stayed over there, and then I don't, I don't get the whole thing. Finally, when the baby's about to come out, oh, you want to catch on it? I'm like, no, no. Now, forgive me, guys. To me, that's, that's modern day stuff. And back in the day, guys, sat outside, you gave him the, gave him the cigar and did whatever. Have your cigar, whatever. All right? The guys are going to get mad at me. My wife told me I have to catch it. <laughs> the midwives did all that back then. All right. 
again, that's just me. I'm, I'm, I'm squeamish, I guess. I, I don't know. So, but the point Jesus is saying here is this. He's saying that just like labor takes a long time, and then finally, right before the end, he's like, time to push, time to push. I'm like, what, what were we doing the whole time? I'm like, what, what's going on here? What's happening right now, right? Right? That's what's going to happen right before the end. It's going to be labor pains for a long time. Then right before the end, Jesus is going to push in the kingdom of God. All right? So he's telling his church, he's telling his people, he's telling them, listen, you're going to hear of wars, you're going to hear of rumors of wars, you're going to hear of pestilence. These things are going to happen. These are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9, take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten, you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake and for a testimony against them. Listen to this. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you, and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Neither do you premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak you. For it is not you that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Brother shall betray brother to death, the father the son. Children shall rise up against their parents, and shall curse them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now listen. There's a lot here. It's really interesting because he starts the first part of the Olivet Discourse like this. And then there's a, something happens in verse 15. And then he's going to almost repeat again some of the same things that are going to happen after verse 15. It's like a repeat. So this is what I think. This is what I teach. Jesus is using the word you. So is he really talking to his disciples? Because that's the first century argument. The first century argument is, see, he's talking to his disciples. All this had to happen in the first century. He says, you shall be delivered up the synag- in, in the synagogues. You shall be hated by all nations. This is going to happen to you. So yes, he's talking to his disciples. Now stay with me. But Jesus is a prophet. Also, God raised up a prophet like unto Moses. So not only is Jesus talking to his disciples, he's going to transition and he's going to talk to you who are around in the last days. He's going to warn his people. He's going to actually tell us, let the reader understand. Let the reader understand. Let us understand these things. So he does tell his disciples what's going to happen with the destruction of the temple, what's going to happen with persecution with them, what's going to happen when they're losing their lives in the first century for the sake of the gospel. He goes, don't worry. He goes, you don't need a script. God's going to be with you in that day. When those things happen, he'll tell you what to say. God will tell you what to speak. You will be able to speak in the name of the Lord when the pressure's on. He says, don't worry. God's going to be with you. And then he transitions here. In verse 14 and verse 15, he does the same thing in Matthew 24. Same discourse. Same thing, you just get a little more detail. But listen to this. But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, where? Standing where it ought not. Let him that reads understand. Jesus is telling something uh, something here. Read what? The New Testament wasn't even written yet. Read what? Read the scriptures. Read the rest of the New Testament that is written in the first century. Yes, Daniel does talk about this in the Old Testament too. But we get more details about what's going to happen in the last days. Because remember, don't forget what were, what were Peter, James, John, and Andrew's question to Jesus. When, when, when's the temple going to be destroyed? And what's going to be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? Not just when's the temple going to be destroyed. And what's going to be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? They had three, three questions they asked Jesus. Mark gives us two of them. 
Matthew's gospel fills in the details that they really ask three questions. Now stay with me. He basically tells them, and then at, right after this parable, it's interesting, because he's going to give them more of a hint of what's going to happen in the church age. He basically tells them, the Son of Man is as a man that goes into a far country. So he's telling them, he's warning them that, listen, what's going to happen isn't going to all happen right away. I'm like a person that's going away for a long time. But then I'm going to come back again. But he gives a line of demarcation here. How do you know you're in the last days? I taught this not too long ago. I don't know if it was a Wednesday night service or a 9 a.m. service as we were in between books at the 9 a.m. But this is how you know. Mark 13, 14 tells us, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Let the reader understand. So this is what I believe. I believe that we can see signs, we can see the, you know, the times and the seasons, but you're not going to know you're in the last days until the abomination of desolation hits. But what's the church been doing for the last year? What have we been doing? There's viruses, there's vaccines, this is it! This is it! And then I don't get it. If this is really it, right, this is really it, I'm staying home though. I'm going to stay in. I'm going to get in this little bubble right here, and I'm going to be on the internet all day long. Man, if we're in the last days, the book of Revelation says we're supposed to be out preaching the gospel, man. We're supposed to be out living for Jesus Christ. I don't get it. It's the complete opposite. I say, we're in the last days. I'm going to stay home, and I'm going to be the one to figure out all the details of the second coming and what's going on in the world. I'm like, no, you're not. Jesus tells us you'll know when it's the end. When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now listen. Some of you will know what I'm talking about here. I used to be a pre-trib rapture guy, and they used to teach me that we, all this before any of this happens, you're long gone anyways. You don't have to worry about anything that Matthew 24 talks about. It's talking to Jewish people. Jewish people say, I don't think it is. Were the disciples Jews or Christians? They were Jews that became Christians. Okay? I think it's a Christian book. Matthew's gospel talks about the church more than any other gospel. I think it's an argument from silence to try to say, hey, this is this, this means that. No, 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 no. We, we can't make arguments from silence. We need to take the scripture at face value. So do I think Christians will be around when the abomination of desolation hits? I do. I do. You say, what if you're wrong, Pastor Matt? Well, I'd rather be wrong and prepared. Okay? Prepared. All right? Then, then and looking around, then be wrong the other way and be totally taken off guard. And I'm pretty sure I'm not. Because I'm just going to let the Bible say what it says. So let the Bible say what it says. When you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that reads understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Now listen, this is one of the things that did not happen in the first century. There was no abomination of desolation set up in any temple, any rebuilt tent, nothing. The temple was destroyed. Nothing was set up in the first century, and people were forced to bow down and worship it. That did not happen. That never happened. So what scholars have done with the text, some, they say, well, maybe Jesus is talking about something else. Maybe he doesn't really mean that people are going to see something. And then there's this theology that goes like this. Well, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and the temple of God is now in your heart in the New Testament. So anybody who doesn't belong to, to Jesus, they're, they're really the temple of Satan, and that's the abomination of desolation. I don't believe that. I think Jesus makes it pretty clear. He tells us in verses 1 through 13, wars, rumors of wars, Nations rising against nation. These are labor pains. But when you see this take place, time to push. Time to push. Baby's coming. Kingdom of God's being ushered in. So what's the abomination of desolation? What is that, Pastor Matt? What is that? Well, Jesus tells you. 
Paul piggybacks on it in 2 Thessalonians 2. Paul says, let no man deceive you. Listen to me. He says, let no man deceive you. That day shall not come. The last days. Why is he writing that to the Thessalonian church? The last days are upon us. The last days are upon us. I mean, there's so much persecution. Let's sell everything and just sit on a mountain. Paul says, no. Don't let anybody deceive you. That day shall not come unless there be a falling away first and then the son of perdition is revealed. What does he do? Antichrist. He exalts himself above all that is called God and he takes his seat in the temple declaring that he is God. And he goes, don't you remember when I was with you, I told you these things? That's the abomination of desolation. That's exactly what Daniel said in Daniel 11. It's exactly what Jesus said in Mark 13 and Matthew 24. It's exactly what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2. It's exactly what Revelation 13, 12 and 13 teach. The prophets are telling the same story. The Bible interprets itself. Yay for Jesus Christ, not for Antichrist. All right? All right. So, listen. Now, again, we live in a day and age. The scriptures tell us in Daniel 9, when the end times come, they can, they're going to come like a flood real fast. Real fast. So we live in a day and age. Yes, they can set up a temple, rebuild something, and set up worship in, uh, in two weeks. They have it all ready and prepared. You know where the Wailing Wall is? And on the mountain Israel, they're not allowed on top because the Muslims control that part of the Temple Mount. So the Jewish people, the Orthodox Jews, come and pray at the Wailing Wall and they put their little prayers into the wall. All right? They're in, they're in the land in a state of unbelief. They don't believe in Jesus. Okay, they don't believe in Jesus yet. So what some of the Orthodox Jews have done they know that that's where the sacrifices have to take place. That's where the temple reconstruction needs to happen. They actually carved out a temple underneath the mountain, inside the Wailing Wall. Look it up. Google it. They got all the artifacts in there, the articles. So these things, could they happen quickly? Yes, they can. Is everything ready for these things to happen? Yes, they are. Do we need to watch? Do we need to discern? Yes. But the last thing we need to do is sit back and say, hey, you know something? I'm, I'm, I'm not going out. We're in the last days. I'm just going to read the internet and study what's going on. You'll drive yourself crazy like that. God's, you're doing exactly what the Thessalonian church did in the first century. Listen, I'm sure you know people like that. I don't go to church anymore. I don't trust this one. I don't know that one. I, 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 I got to study what's going on. I'm sure you know people that you're doing exactly what the Thessalonian church did in the first century. We need to come together. We need to meet together. We need to worship the Lord together. We need to evangelize. We need to build up the body of Christ. That's what we're called to do. Listen, all the stuff we do online and all that stuff, great. We should do that. It's outreach, but this is in reach here. You need to build up the body of Christ so we can in turn do the work of the ministry. So what's the abomination of desolation? The same thing Daniel talks about, the same thing Paul talks about, same thing Jesus talked about, same thing John talks about in Revelation. There's going to be some kind of structure on the Temple Mount or within it or something's going to happen over there. The whole world's going to be able to see that someone's going to do signs and wonders like never before and they're going to take their seat in the temple and say that I'm God Jesus is not God. And then he's going to set up an image. And he's going to say to, to people, you need to worship the image. Just like, Dan, in, in, just like it says in Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar in his image. Same thing. That has not happened yet. Can it happen? Can it happen quick? Yes. But you will not know you're in the last days until these things happen happen. By the way, it says in Daniel, well, we'll know we're in the last days because it says he'll confirm a covenant with many for one week. So Antichrist is going to be this major world ruler. He's going to get a seven-year covenant in place, and you're just going to sign off on it. And they're going to say, we're going to know that's him, but we'll be whisked away right as that happens. And I say, no, 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 no. It says he's a little horn. Nobody knows who he is. He just confirms the covenant. He signs off on it for one week, for seven years. It could be 10 years. It could be 20 years, but he signs off for seven years. 
And in the midst of the week, he breaks the covenant. Okay? And that's when the abomination of desolation is set up. That's when the world will be caused to worship and follow the beast and the image of the beast. Has not happened yet. It could happen real quick, real fast. When that happens, look what he says. When this happens, in that day, he's going to talk about those days, those days, those days. And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the, into the house. When this happens, the abomination of desolation. Neither let them enter therein to take anything out of his house. So it does start, the persecution starts right in Israel from the temple mount. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And pray that you, that you, your flight, be not in winter. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created until this time neither shall ever shall be. Hasn't happened yet. There's been a lot of persecution for the people of God, for the Jewish people and for Christians, a lot of it. But Jesus says when it happens in this day, it's going to be like never before. Like never before. Listen. We think we're persecuted persecute in the United States because we're losing this right and now you might have to take this shot to fly and yeah, I can't do this anymore and they're taking our guns away and we think it's like, it's the end of the world. Look, oh my goodness, all my freedoms. I don't like my freedoms being taken. I don't like anybody telling me what to do. Just like I'm sure you don't. But this ain't last day's persecution, brothers and sisters, that we're going through here. I just want to let you know that. I can't believe what they're doing to me. I can't believe it. What? Do you know what? We have brothers and sisters in other countries, in the Middle East and in parts of the world, that they are being hunted down, seemingly like the book of Revelation talks about. They're being slaughtered, and their organs are being put on the black market on the Internet. Yes, that happens right now. Right now. We think, I can't take my guns away. I can't believe it. When this happens, it's going to be even worse, Jesus says. Literally, it says, except those days be short and no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he will shorten those days. The elect cannot be deceived. Who are the elect? Those who really love Jesus. Those who really know God. Those who are born again and saved. That's who the elect is. The elect cannot be deceived. Jesus said signs and, signs and wonders will happen, that if it were possible, it would deceive the elect. Thank God he said, if it were possible, we will not be deceived if you really love Jesus. By the way, if you read through Mark, and if you read through Luke's account of this, and if you read through Matthew's account of this, Jesus tells us the only way you will be deceived in the last days and listen to me, I say this all the time. We're all, you know, trying to figure out what are the details of how this is going to work out. Rapture's here, this is happening there. That's going to have all these, you know, timelines and everything else. And we got it figured out so we can't be deceived and we won't be deceived. No, Jesus says the only way you'll be deceived, he tells you how. If you live like the world. That's what he said. If you're a worldly, said faith Christian. So it seems to me that our doctrine and what we believe about the last days is supposed to reach the heart, not just the mind. Because there's going to be those who think they got it all figured out, you know what? But their hearts are not on fire for Jesus Christ. They don't love the Lord. They will miss it. They will be deceived. They will be part of the ones who fall away. Fall away. When these days do hit, when the abomination of desolation is set up, God says he's going to shorten the days because no flesh will be saved unless he shortens the days. We, we're not sure what that means. We're not sure what that means. What does it mean? Does he mean no flesh of his elect will make it through this horrible time that's coming? It could be. Or, or is he saying no flesh at all in the world will be saved like, like it was in Noah's day? Now, again, there's theories as to what Jesus is talking about. There's going to be, you know, genetic, you know, 
people are going to manipulate the gene pool and this and that, and that's why the vaccine is this and that's that, and I get all that. I get all that. And that's why Jesus has to shorten the days. And then I talked about this, to like, like two vax and not two vax. All right, again, my, my, my take on this is that's an issue. It's a conviction issue between you and God. I, I can get emails and YouTubes and all that stuff, but it's a conviction between you and God. Do I like what the vaccines are doing? They put in the thing, the, the va- no. But I didn't like what they were doing to them 20, 21 years ago either. You know, stem cells and aborted tissue and all that. What, what's, you know, that's evil too. It's evil too. And then I said this, did you know they have now? Well, I'm not taking it, I'm not taking it. And again, that's between you and God. I didn't take it. But listen, did you know now it's, they're coming out, it's an aerosol form. That when you walk into an airport or whatever, they'll be able to just spray the aerosol on you and you'll, you'll, you'll be forced to take it then. Then what are you going to do? Then what are you going to do? You're going to dodge that? How are you going to dodge that one? All right? That's what I mean. We get caught up on all these things and all that. I don't like it. I don't like, I don't like the way things are going down. But, you know, I, well, what if we're going to go over here to this country and help feed the poor and preach the gospel and this and that, but we can't do it unless we take the vaccine? The vaccine is not the mark of the beast. It's not. I don't like it. I don't agree with what's going on with it, but it's not the mark of the beast. All right? Well, it's leading up to it, Pastor Matt. That's what they're going to do, buy, sell, or trade. I know that everything's leading up to it. That is, everything is. Your phones are doing it. Everything's leading up to it. Again, it's not, it's not the technology that is evil. It's going to be the use of the technology in the last days. So again, if you want to be against technology, then get rid of your phones, get rid of everything, go do what the Thessalonians did, and live up in the woods somewhere. All right? And some people do that, and that's cool. You can do that. You can do that. Well, I watch Pastor so-and-so. This is what he's saying. This is what they're doing. And Okay, so all the people in other countries where it's mandated for everybody, everybody's going to hell there because they took the vaccine. I don't think so. I don't think so. When it's tied to, when the mock is tied to worship of an antichrist and the abomination of desolation, when you see that, then you will know. Don't take the mark. Then you will know. Well, Pastor Matt, you're watering down with the vaccine. We've got to take a stance on this. I'm going to take a stance on the word of God. All right? That's what I'm going to do. Again, I told you my heart on it is I don't like it. I don't, I'm not doing it, but uh, whatever. If you, do you think it's between you and the Lord, then go do that. That's up to you. It's up to you and Jesus. When these days hit, which they could be close, when these days hit, Jesus tells us exactly what's going to happen. Now listen, there's a repeat right after this and everything he said in verses 1 through 13 about false Christ, wars, and all that, there's a full repeat of it. So I believe there's a break. Verses 1 through 13, beginning of sorrows, long time, Verses 14 to the end, last days. And then, verse 21. And then, then, when? After the abomination of desolation is set up. And then, if any man shall say to you, lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. Then, listen, he is Christ, And people say that, I am Christ. He says, they're not. So what's going to happen in the last days? Daniel tells us, Jesus tells us, Paul tells us, there's going to be something happening with the spiritual realm that the veil between this side and that side is going to be broken down a little bit. Just like it was in the days of Noah. Now listen to me. And people are going to be able to do some signs and wonders. And they're going to say, I am Christ. I am the one to follow. I am the one that you need to follow after and live for. I'm what it's all about. That's what Antichrist is going to do. Jesus says if people start to do that, believe them not. By the way, how do you know a false teacher from a true teacher? A true teacher is going to lift up Jesus Christ and him only. A true teacher is going to say, I must decrease, but he must increase. That's what a true teacher is going to do. 
A false teacher is going to say, hey, look at me, follow me, be like me. No, that's a fake teacher. For false Christ and false prophets, verse 22, shall rise, shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take heed. Behold, I foretold you all these things. But in those days, what days? Days that are still future. In those days, listen, after that, tri after that tribulation, when is Jesus coming? He tells us. There's no hint anywhere before this of when he's coming. He tells us right when. In those days, after that tribulation... The sun shall be darkened. The moon shall not give her light. The stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. That didn't happen in the first century. That hasn't happened yet. He tells us what's going to, remember, they said, Jesus, when are these things going to take place with the destruction of the temple? Right? What's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Here's your sign. Here's your sign. Sun's going to be darkened. Moon doesn't give its light. The stars are going to fall. That has not happened yet. When that happens, he says, you know what? You're real close. You're, look up, your redemption draws nigh. And I say, surely, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I don't sit there and say, oh, God, I want to get ready. Dodge me out of the tribulation. Get me away from this. I'm, I'm afraid. I don't want to, you know, I want to live it up for my American way and values and rights. And then, you know what? Jesus, take me out here. No, I say if I'm here for the tribulation and it gets worse, give me the strength to live for you, stand for you, minister to you, and minister for you and pass on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I say. That's what I say. In those days, after the tribulation, sun will be dark and moon doesn't give its light. Stars fall from the skies. That's the sign. That's the sign. When the moon goes dark, the sun goes out, the stars go out, start to fall, shooting stars everywhere. Everything goes black. Jesus said, don't follow false Christ who say, I'm him, I'm him. He goes, don't go after them. What does he say? As lightning shines from the east and goes to the west, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. Meaning that, what's going to happen? You ever see lightning? You see lightning? Bang, and you're like, and it gets your attention. Whoa. A couple weeks ago, there was one so close, I thought it was in the house. I thought it was in the house. I was like, Whoa. That's what's going to happen when Jesus comes. This is my belief. I believe that that dimension hits this dimension all at once. That heaven is opened. Now how you got a little foretaste of that in the, in, in the, um, the first coming in, in, in the incarnation when the shepherds were there trying to figure out if, if, you know, if that was the Christ that was born. And then all of a sudden there's a multitude of angels right there with them. And they're like, whoa. That's what's going to happen in the last days. Right before Jesus comes, there's going to be chaos on earth. Some people that are the worldly people are going to be saying, well, oh, this is just business as usual. You know, all these religious fanatics and nuts. There's going to be mass persecution in different pockets of the world. That's what's going to be going on. And then all of a sudden, what's going to happen is the lights are going to go out and then the lights are going to come on. And that dimension is going to hit this dimension. That's what's going to happen. And then people will tremble in fear, Revelation tells us, for those things that are coming upon the earth. What's coming upon the earth? Jesus as the judge. Not the tribulation. Jesus as the judge. They're going to be in fear. They're going to say, hide us in the rocks, in the crevices. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb and him who sits on the throne. Who are they hiding from? They're hiding from Jesus Christ. And then you shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. You want your resurrection rapture? Here it is. He tells you. Right when he comes. Just like he says in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ the first fruits. When do we get resurrected? And then those who are Christ when? At his coming. Same time, there's your timing verse. What's going to happen? Lights go out, lights come on. That dimension hits this dimension. Jesus is seated on his throne. He's coming back with his holy angels. As he comes back, you know what he does? 
It's getting up time. It's get up from the grave. It's rise from the dead. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from where? From the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. He gathers those who are alive and remain, 1 Thessalonians 4, and he gathers the dead in Christ who are in the ground, like Daniel 12 tells us, resurrection. And then we're like, Yes, Lord, we're with you. And everybody else is like this. <laughs> Jesus is coming. Do I think everything's in place for these things to spring on the earth like a flood? I do. I do. Now, listen, I don't live my life every day, you know, through what's going on in, on the news. I live my life every day by what the scriptures teach, and I peek out to see what's going on in the world just to make sure. But I don't get sensational. But hey, is it this? Is it that? Is it this? Because you know what you start doing when you do that? You say, oh, there's an earthquake. There's a flood. There's a this. There's a that. There's this treaty. There's that. And then all you're doing is thinking about that, and you're not thinking about your walk with Jesus Christ. You got to be able to do both. Be able to do both. You got to look and wait for Jesus. You can't be the Christian that said, my Lord delays his coming. We don't have to worry about that second coming stuff. My Lord delays his coming. He says, that's a wicked servant. That's what he says. But he does say this. We need to occupy till he comes. We need to make the most of what he's given to us and use it for his kingdom and glory. And when he comes, you know what you get? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord.